Hello everyone, wherever you are and whenever you are, welcome to this very special episode of the Pod of Many Things. Um, it's me, Addison, your favourite friendly furball wizard, and as always, I'm joined by Leon, our favourite bard officer who keeps this whole thing running really whilst I just talk. And today is really exciting, it's really special because I'm not going to call it like a sponsorship, but I think this is a, a, our first real collaboration with someone, with a product that we're really excited about. So without further ado, let's meet today's guest and talk to them, not just about their project, but also about Kickstarter, which is something. So today's guest is Nick Shepley from Verse Studios, the creators and publishers behind Arklands. So say hi, Nick. Hi, hi, it's nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, it's really nice to have you on. Uh, you've recently created an exciting new D&D 5e setting. And it's oh. on Kickstarter. Is, yeah. Am I right? That's um, right. That's right. Uh, funded too. Fully funded, yeah. That, yeah. And that's that's amazing considering... Because uh, I do want to ask you about uh, something about Kickstarter. To, okay. Um, some stuff about Kickstarter. So how about before we like dive into like your, your business side... Let's get to know you a bit personally first. So let's talk about your history in tabletop RPGs or tabletop games in general. Well, then... I, I'm, I, I've like, um, you know, that sort of like movies where somebody's been frozen in time, sort of like Demolition Man. No, no, no. I'm, first, <laughs> yeah. I'm first edition man, right? You know, uh, they, they unfroze me in about 2015 when I realised that Dungeons and Dragons was still actually going. Um, uh, yeah, I know. I, um, I, I first started playing Dungeons and Dragons in 1986 um I know some pedigree I know you know like uh that was that was like in Tolkien terms like the you know the first age of D&D you know like um um the the devil so, worshipping days <laughs> well yeah no I mean you, you joke but it was like that back in mm. back back in back in the day when I was at school and you wanted to be you know, you know look hard in front of the other kids you listen to black sabbath and pretended you were satanist and um the, the, the there was this huge moral panic which emanated from america where a great deal of these moral panics emanate from that if people um play dungeons and dragons they would become satan worshippers which uh, you know hasn't hasn't quite panned out like that but um my experiences of, of dungeons and dragons uh, this is the interesting bit for now is that when I first started playing it, it was a game that was basically owned by white straight boys, um, or at least white boys who, you know. Um, and, and I've, the, I've the seen whole... Stranger Things. There was one black kid that played, okay? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's it. That's it. And, and um, but for the, but the, the world of, of Dungeons and Dragons is now so radically culturally transformed, you know, thank goodness. The, the, the doors of the of the game have been opened up, you know, it, it, mainly I would say in the last ten years, but obviously, you know, in stages over that, to um, everybody who wants to play it, and I, I I get that sense sometimes that there are people my age, you know, the forties and fifties now, who kind of still think it would be really good if we could have our game back and you know that all these youngsters who are coming in and ruining it for everybody with their various new editions and their podcasts and their you know everything else fan art and, and everything else if they would kind of just go away again and we can have fighters and clerics and back to the sort of the, the rather stable standard world of first edition well i think that that ship has sailed really hasn't it you know uh, and it ain't coming back I think that's that idea of like diversity is actually quite well reflected in your product actually and I, and I do want to get into that a bit in yeah. a bit more detail yeah uh, later on but I also want to talk about something that I'm kind of I'm kind of really interested in with because I'm quite interested in like the the business side of nerddom oh, like, yeah. I, I, like owning game stores and owning like gaming cafes and stuff um can, can we talk a bit about Versus Studios? Is it a team of people? Yeah, is it, just it is. It is. It's, um, it, it basically uh, started out as a kind of a collaboration between me and... I, I'm, I'm here based in Cardiff. I mean, a couple of people I knew here 
Um, and we started out really because um, I was having a sort of a midlife crisis. Um, my, uh, I, I, I'd just become a dad and one night when I was up at four in the morning, and by the way, if, if, if anyone out there listening has children or they're just about to have a child, at four in the morning you'll have all sorts of crazy ideas about things just you know just roll with it it'll be all right um so i was with the baby at four in the morning um and then i thought that fantasy universe i've had bubbling away in my head I've, i i need to do something about this um and so the next day i got onto the phone to some people and they came back to me going yes let's do this let's, let's make this thing and it took us a while to figure out what the world was and you know to smash ideas together and eliminate certain things and a couple of years later we were uh, at dragon meet the big convention in london kind of touting our world around not sure exactly what we're going to do with it and we met um a couple of guys um a superb um games designer um if you looking anyone's looking for an amazing uh, games designer to work with look up uh micah brogan um, uh, you can find him on Twitter. He's uh, a really, really talented guy. And um, the, 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 these sort of um, um, uh, newcomers to the group said, "Yes, we're, we're in." And it was—it's one of these funny things that happens in life when you get um, four or five people, each bringing something unique to the table, but each kind of understanding the shared vision and then going, "Let's do this." And, and it's sort of it's rare, but it sort of just happened in this case. Um, and so, Verse Studios has kind of evolved from an idea into something now that's ready to uh, bring, um, I think, a fairly original games concept to to the D&D world. No, I, I agree. I think that's, re- that's a really cool way to think about it as well, like just having these like minds meet together and somehow or cohesively work together. Sure. Um. Uh. Oh, what I was going to say, because you said something that I was quite really uh, quite interested in. Um, in terms of like, uh, your team. So your your team were they people you'd always known, or were they people who like you'd met through gaming or? Yeah. Like well, the 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 people in Cardiff I'd, I'd known for uh, for many a year uh, from various different things I I had done for a living. Um, and uh, you, you know, you just kind of sort of people just sort of kind of come along at certain interesting times, really, don't they? It's, uh, it was all uh, Artlands and Verse Studios has all been kind of interestingly kind of synchronous and things happening in curious coincidences, if you uh, if you believe in all that sort of business. Ah, so that's, that's really cool. So yeah, yeah. Well, Glit, Nick, I am very glad that you've decided to give us some of your time and talk to us, not just about Art Clans and Verse Studios, but about Kickstarter, how Kickstarter works and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so, Nick, what I'm hoping to do is we, we're kind of going to, it may run a bit longer than our normal talks, okay. hopefully not too, not hopefully not too much, but I kind of want to split the podcast into two different sections. I want to talk about Kickstarter and like mm-hmm. Kickstarter in general, how you found using it, how it works and um how it's helping creators and stuff and its effect on the tabletop landscape in general but then i also want to like end talking about your passion project leave people with an impression about your 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 product okay that sounds so, good so um let's uh, we're, we're gonna take it in turns asking you questions and come in when we when we feel like uh okay it, like we want you to expand or something like that so okay. on my list of questions i've got here uh what is kickstarter really because it, it, though it seems to be everywhere nowadays um i think it would be good to explain to people what it is and how it how it works because some people think they understand kickstarter and i thought that as well for a very long okay. time but then i was like oh Oh, I, I don't think I understand this as well as I think I do. So how about from your experience, what what do you think Kickstarter is? What does it do for you and stuff like that? Okay, well, I mean, I I can give a, a, a view based on one successfully funded Kickstarter. So I wouldn't consider myself an expert, but my, my experience is this. 
is that in, in many ways, Kickstarter is kind of like a search engine. So, for example, you, you, you put a project on there, I'm going to create a new 5th um, edition world, and um, then what Kickstarter... Uh, my experience was that Kickstarter actually found within the, um, the, the, those who are already users of Kickstarter people to, to, to fund you. This is quite remarkable, really. Um, if you looked at the stats about where the search uh, was coming from, some of the times it was people that I, um, you know, deliberately kind of said, you know, come and back us, please, and a little, other little networks I, I was in. But a lot of the time, there are people going through Kickstarter, uh, Kickstarter pitching them with um, new ideas, new concepts, new new things to back. And I'm I'm sure there's there's a kind of a Kickstarter addiction. I really am. Um, the, the the acid test is uh, find somebody um, find a a backer on Kickstarter to follow, uh, and look at how many things that they back. It's very very instructive. There are people backing hundreds and hundreds of Kickstarters every single year of varying quality. So it it, it seems to op- operate kind of like that. It's a remarkable, um, it's a remarkable platform. I think if you use it in the correct way, and if you don't, it can be very disappointing, as with so many things in life. But if you use it in the right way, it can uh, really, really aid your chances. Um, and I think the, you know, Kickstarter's su- suggestions as to how you should lay out your campaign um, very, very clearly and simply by telling people what it is you're actually doing. Um, and using really, really cool artwork, and also spending a lot of time and care over your uh, rewards and over your stretch goals, um, and absolutely using using video, um, because Kickstarter has become a very, very crowded marketplace. Um, there are some great examples. I mean, what I did to start off with is I just simply went through um and created a list of the 20 kickstarters i thought was brilliant and the kind of thing that um i would certainly give money to and then i was thinking well if i am considering giving money to these things then they must be doing something you know what the product is like at the other end is slightly irrelevant at this stage because what they're saying about it and how they're presenting it and marketing it is is great so anyone that's looking to to kickstart i would say um if your product is underway and you know you, you've got a nice little project and it's coming along, don't worry about it being completed by the time you kickstart. Because what you're doing really to uh, when you're kickstarting is you're presenting um, people backers with a kind of a proposition. You're saying here is basically um, if you. Think we're reliable enough what will be coming out of the other end uh, you know if you're kickstarting in january you'll be getting this in about july um and so that gives you six months to finish the thing and kickstarter if you can fully fund your campaign then gives you a chunk of cash basically to to invest in a decent product or to do whatever you've got to do but it the, that's almost by the by what it does it gives you a big audience of people that go, ah, right, well, this is this is a thing. This is a, you know, this isn't some, a figment of someone's imagination. This is a decent uh, product out there that's going to be going to be interesting. Uh, and so, Kickstarter it, it works in many different ways. Um, and I was I was really kind of blown away with the the response that we got. Um, I'd read, uh, and by the way, I, the, the book I would recommend to anybody that wants to to do a Kickstarter successfully is a, a kind of a, a general book on product launch. It's called Launch by Jeff Walker, and I I read that, which has got nothing to do with Dungeons and Dragons and everything to do with sort of being some rich man. I can imagine the skills are transferable though. Like, well, um... yeah, it, you know, you could be launching pretty much anything really. Yeah. But um, it's um, a very handy book to get the idea of um, um, because what you're doing really when you're starting a Kickstarter is you're doing a product launch. Um, so, uh, by the way, anybody, I'm 
totally happy to dole out any any thoughts on this completely for free because you know I've only done one Kickstarter and I don't consider myself to be a consultant or anything. Y- anyone that wants to uh, get hold of me on Twitter and ask me uh, about their Kickstarter campaign, I'm totally happy to you know give them the time of day and have a chat about it. So uh, yes, there you go. You're already like a more more expert than me and Leon because we've never used Kickstarter, let alone got one to work. So, like, but thank you very much for offering that help. Oh, you're, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Was, was, was Kickstarter always the plan? Did you ever consider um, taking your taking it to a publisher or anything like that, or was it just Kickstarter? That's the plan. That's what we're going to do from the very beginning. I think it's easier. Well. I think it's easier to take an idea like Art Clans, which is basically uh, a fifth edition world with an open system of magic creation sort of bolted onto it and or merged into it. It's easy to go to um, a, a role play game and say, would you like this? Would you be willing to invest, say, 20 quid in it? Than to go to uh, a, a publisher, uh, the only publisher you could conceive of, be, well, there's a handful, but uh, who, who might easily go well you know can we not just kind of change this and change that and that seems a bit risky and let's not do that and you know by the by the time I'm being quite hard on publishers who I've never met actually this is very judgmental of me but um, <laughs> my, 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 my that's was, the general view uh, um, it's, yeah, it's your pure be. unadulterated unfiltered work without yeah. you know having something done by uh, a committee of people that weren't even there from the beginning of the project absolutely absolutely you know and, and there's there's a whole bunch of kind of um fantasy tropes that i, I didn't kind of want to to have in art clans at all which i felt might be kind of stuffed in there at the last minute so it getting excitement from the end user in many ways is a much better thing to do than to go through all the gatekeepers who could quite easily go mm, no we we thought about this project for six months. We think we'll just sort of waste your time now and say no. Um, I've been uh, in, in my my various other incarnations. I'm a history teacher, and I've written uh, textbooks for uh, various exam boards. And um, I've been on various other publishing projects, and um, you know, oh, really good, enjoyable projects. Just again, once again, cover yourself in case anyone's listening. But you, you're always at the mercy of somebody powerful and indifferent uh, at the end of the day so um that's a really good way to think about it I, i'm an english teacher as well so i so um i've heard like horror stories of people who are like write exam papers and like go and pitch them because the, yeah. you have to, like pitch them don't you and yeah. then there's someone who's never worked in education telling you that your exam paper is too hard or too yeah is that that's that sort of thing we um Another kind of little little industry insight. Uh, our first conversation with uh, Asmodi, who you know they're like, you know the, the Empire in Star Wars, aren't they? They're the baddies. Um, uh, the uh, who who were uh, you know the possible distributor for the book. They came back and basically said we would need 60 percent of the you know the cover price of the book. <coughs> now, if you think that. If you were to go to a probably a standard role play game shop, you're looking at um, giving them giving the retailer forty percent, which is you know out of a uh, thirty five pound book, that's a, you know a reasonable deal for the retailer and the uh, and, and, and the, the book. But Asmodee were basically saying, you know, can we have every penny you would likely make from this book for? Um, arguably nothing so so no we, we, we didn't um we didn't, we didn't go down that route and compared to uh, uh kickstarter do, do they take a uh, well i they, assume they take they, they take do percentage. they do um i forget the percentage um they, they take a you know a reasonable bite out of um out of what you make but the um the project is still you know pretty viable even even as a result of that uh, I don't. I don't think Kickstarter's percentages are excessive, all, all things considered. 
because uh, they just wouldn't be appropriate into your, into your targets, can't you? You can factor that percentage in. Yeah, yeah. Whereas it's it's a lot more difficult if you go down the publisher route. Yeah, because um, you're also locked into contracts and stuff with publishers. Whereas, whereas in in Kickstarter, although you've got like terms of service of using Kickstarter and like you're not allowed to like make racist products, which obviously you haven't because we've we've read it and it. Uh, but um, you you get to do that. You you're not contractually ob- obligated to do anything you no. just need to deliver the product the best you can yeah for what you've been given yeah um yeah without without any racism at all you know just mm-hmm. no way um, it's, it's, it's not hard no but i'm, I'm, I'm just saying because like obviously uh kickstarter does have like a like a, a thing of a, t- a, t- a terms of service of like projects you're not allowed to put on there and i like, um uh, and I, and they're, it's not anything like this that's hard. It's like no. pretty much don't do anything that will hurt other people. Don't it's the, the yeah. obvious ones, really, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, like, unlike in a contract, where if you're in a contract, you would there would be like little things like, oh yeah, you're not allowed to, hmm. um, you're not allowed to have it. So this happens or whatever, yeah. because that's too close to this system or this setting or this yeah. fact, like it gets it gets very f- yeah. uh, finickety in contract law whereas in kickstarter it's just like yo do what you can just yeah don't well, I, I guess the best way to look at it and excuse my french is don't be a dick is pretty much yeah. how kickstarter does it like <laughs> be a dick. Be a dick. you know if you feel if you feel that you could discuss your role play game at a dinner party with polite company then really you know you have to ask yourself is, is is this the right project the thing that's always worth remembering as well with the um um if you're doing a dnd kickstarter is to make sure that you read the um uh wizards of the coast open license stuff very very carefully oh, yeah uh, and by and large you can do most things as long as you don't call it a dungeons and dragons uh product or you know uh, accidentally use any of the um, the sort of the uh, trademarks and, and, and that kind of thing. And you know, in Artlands on page one, it says this is not an official D and D product. Mm. Uh, we, we use we are using this license that Wizards of the Coast say we can do. Uh, I think but... even Green Ronin books do that. And Green yeah. Ronin is an established publisher, so when they release like five E content yeah. they they do the same thing they say this book is made with the D open in in accordance with the D open license yeah yeah it's 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 like that i mean D D i think are up there with i mean wizards of the coast do think are owned by hasbro i think they're kind of up there with disney for uh lawyering up about uh copyright infringement mm. so uh actually i should say nice things because they might one day see the book and go wow that's brilliant we've got to buy it off you for tons of money this um, uh, uh, that happens in my fantasy head, by the way. That's like, well, the same. I, I don't know if if you've ever watched Critical Role. I, uh, I have on occasion, yes. But um, when Matt, Matthew Mercer, bearing in mind he did massive things for for Dungeons and Dragons in general, and he'd he'd worked with Wizards of the Coast on other products. When he came to release his first setting book, he actually had a lot of trouble with Wizards of the Coast. Like he and he and he said so on a stream because like things like they wouldn't let him use their gods. So oh. if you have the first group, if you have the first book, sorry, the group of gods all have different names, but you know which gods they are from D and D because of the fact that they wouldn't let him use them. And there was there was little things that he said were really hard to navigate. So 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 I understand. I feel as if I understand that. And he said the same thing actually. He had a bit of a a bit of a, a gripe at one point before they sponsored them mm-hmm. on on the stream and he said because dnd won't let me use their stuff and um, and now he's like he, he's got his own book I know. Um, he's, yeah he's... he's a massive contributor so I, th- I think if they like your stuff they like your stuff and from what i've i've read in the playtest material and hopefully when we when we manage to get our hands on the on the finalized product to, mm-hmm. to review later on down the line I don't think there's much arguing with the quality of this product, personally. Oh, thank you. So, um, another question I had is, you kind of mentioned it in in when we talked about what is Kickstarter, but how did you, because not all Kickstarters work, so what no. do you think you did that made your Kickstarter successful? How did you market and grow it? 
like we use a we, yeah uh, we, we, we used a, a basically a, a launch sequence and so if you imagine that there's a whole bunch of people have never heard of you uh, and you pitch to them and say hey it's me and i've done this thing and i know you like dungeons and dragons and so i've got a dungeons and dragons thingy well then you have to think of them as a cold audience the sort of people that if you were to talk to them at a, in a, at a, at a party in a nightclub will just stare at you blankly because they don't know who you are they know nothing about you and the whole point of a launch strategy is to go is is to warm audiences up to take them from cold to warm to to hot if you will um and you have to do that quite a long time before you're you're actually launching so you're you have to put out basically quite a long period of non-salesy content um and you know you said earlier you know when in doubt don't be a dick well it's <laughs> sort of like that so for example if you're if, if you go to sell to people they instinctively don't like it they say that you don't really have the right to sell to them because you haven't got a relationship with them. just as you you haven't you can't go and strike up a conversation with somebody in the street who you don't know so there's the there are all these communities out there for D D and whatever else you're interested in on twitter on in facebook groups but you just hang out and get to know people and, and talk to people and forget, shelve the idea of selling anything or even attracting them to a Kickstarter for a good few weeks until they know you and they like you and they trust you. And, and actually, if you go about it the right way, you are actually being a sincere guy. Um, and you, you're not going, haha, I shall build a friendship with this person until I pitch them with my Kickstarter. No, you, you basically um, do what you'd normally do and be a, a good citizen in, in that community. And when you're liked and you've given people the time of day and answered questions and said, well, I'd DM it in this way or, you know, or I, and perhaps you can introduce this kind of monster into your campaign and those kinds of things, you can go, and do you know what? We've actually got a Kickstarter. And, but at that, at that point, when you've interacted with people and they like you and you're genuine, they will have a look at your Kickstarter. And if it's good and you've got good art and it's all laid out nicely and you've explained it well, they'll get excited by it. Uh, and it and, and it kind of works like that. And it, I get in the sense, a lot of the time, it's a bit like, you know, not that I would know, because I'm not interested in sports at all, but sort of almost like supporting your local football team. If you are in a D&D group and people know you, pretty cool, um, are friendly and kind. When you go, I've got this thing, and, you know, obviously it has to be good, people will be really inclined to support it because they they know you and what people are looking to do the world over is have relationships to forge relationships to connect we are lonely lonely people um and at this this point in our our society to to go deep um there are people who crave connection and crave to be part of something and if you can give them the opportunity not to just to go here's my kickstarter or even back my kickstarter but kind of join the world of my kickstarter um make it as much yours as it is mine then you'll you'll find so you'll you'll find that you you there'll be happy people out there to back you because you're doing something you know kind and and, and caring which is i suppose what i think the current uh, iteration of D&D is, is really all about those kind, caring communities of people gaming together who, who, who you know, who, who want to be uh, cooperative and friendly and compassionate and all that kind of stuff that the world seems to be sadly kind of lacking. So, so it's, it's, it's that. You build those relationships and on the, onto those relationships, then you can really those relationships will support any kind of marketing thing you do that's how you go from cold to warm and eventually when you're ready to really launch and go right it's it's coming that's your last six weeks four weeks even of your campaign and that's where you go from warm to hot and people go oh wow so this thing we've been talking about for ages and i've seen all the artwork and i've got the gist of it boom it's coming 
yeah it is it's going to be out this day so get your get your debit card ready and um you know let's let's do this uh, and that you know without me sounding like a kind of you know arthur daily type spiv that is i think the way to do it um and no doubt there are people out there who raised a lot more money than i have or a lot more money than first studios has uh, and they'll perhaps take odds with that take issue with that and say no you do it a different way but it worked for me what were you going to say leon you look like you had something to say at one point Sweet. I, I I can tell you're a teacher because I have been sitting here captivated. This feels like a a, a seminar. This is a learning experience, a learning experience, and I'm, I'm rather enjoying listening to oh, to your story and and, uh, and, and, okay. and how you've got to where you are. Um, I was going to ask a question. I've forgotten what that question was. <laughs> <laughs> I I I I I noticed that you said that one of the main things that you liked about Kickstarter wasn't just the money aspect, but it was also the audience aspect of it. Mm-hmm. So, um, by the sounds of things, you've got a really like person-centered approach rather than a product-centered approach, which most like big companies would have, where they'd be like, "This is my product," and trying to shove it down people's throats. Yeah. I, I um, do, yeah. so do you think that is a massive part of the success that like people approach becoming involved in these communities? Yeah, like caring basically. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> I think I think so because I mean I mean firstly almost you you know there's the D&D community is quite extraordinary for the number of genuinely lovely kind gentle and generous people there are in it you get the occasional person who in a D&D reddit or a D&D facebook group will come out with all sorts of you know uh, snarky kind of stuff, but they're they're, they're pretty rare. Um, so there are there are people that you know the, the people that you want to engage with, because let's face it, if you're doing a and D Kickstarter or anything else, you want to be getting emails and swapping messages and texts and uh, tweets with nice people, because life is too short to deal with uh, any, anybody else. So that, that so that they're, they're all there. Um, and it, it's, it, it's it's genuinely very lovely to, to to get to know them, and you you find uh, and so it's, it's it's kind of easy in a way to have a, a person centred approach to bringing a product to market when there are so many personable people to get to know. Mm. Also, you know you you get a lot of people with some fantastic ideas. There's some uh, incredible artists out there. And some people who want to share their world with you as much as you want to share your world with them. So it's, there's got to be give and take there. If you try, unless you have a you know a whopping great marketing budget and you're um, a the, you know the market leader, if you try to say, here here's my my vision for my world. I want I don't have an interest in your world. But I want you to consume mine. Um, firstly, that's like a total offence to to other people, uh, to to belittle them and, and treat them like garbage. And you must never do that. You 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 have to be as interested in other people's creations as you are in your own, and as compassionate uh, about other people's visions, because that that's they're, they're super super personal to them, and mm-hmm. and art plans are super super personal to me. And if you if you value other people and value their voices. And say, you know, I want to hear about what you're doing, and let them tell you all about it. And they'll listen to you, and then, if there's a way for, and there, and there is, and I'll talk about it when we talk about spell forging in a bit. There's a way for you to open the door to them and say, you're not just buying a product. I don't just want that. I, I want you to, to share and to shape this world I've created. That you know, if you like it, and you find it interesting, to kind of, you know, own a bit of it really. Then, then I think hopefully you've you've got sort of a, a special kind of bond emerging there. Um, uh, hopefully, anyway. Seems that's, to be working that way so far. That's awesome, though. Like um, we kind of said the same thing in one of our earliest uh, episodes um, about uh, 
about people wanting to find something, and that's why D and D's had a bit of a renaissance. Yeah. So it's so yeah. it's absolutely it's absolutely true. I mean, we we live in this exceedingly atomized society where people are yearning for connection, and the more um, sort of social media there is, the lonelier people get, and so they're wanting something. You know, if you, it's, it's it's incredible, isn't it? That you know you have um, games like you know World of Warcraft and Eve Online and stuff like that, which are the cutting edge of technology, and yet people what they a lot of not, not everybody but a lot of people what they want are a, a, a twenty sided dice, a pencil, and a paper. And yeah, that's why board games and, and stuff are the most. And a person, important. but it's about yeah, a person, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it, and that's what it's all about, really. It's about collaborating with others, creating with others, sharing with others, and being part of a, a sort of a, you know, for want of a better word, a kind of an, an, an intimacy in a way, when everybody is. Uh, have you ever been played a, a role play game and the way the story panned out and what your character did and where they, if they fumbled and dropped their sword or they slew the beast or whatever, afterwards you go, oh, wasn't it amazing when this thing happened? Mm. And it's because you know you 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 might have been playing the games published by Dungeons and Dragons by Wizards of the Coast that somebody else has played a version of that in a town down the road from you and it's gone totally different. So that's made your your game unique and the connection between you all unique. Um, and it's you know something that you 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 can do without going out and you know getting really drunk for example which is traditionally how people connect with one another in great britain you know I mean? yeah um so <laughs> so yeah it, you know it, it, tapping i mean what i would suggest if i was time traveling back to myself when i was considering art clans you know five years ago is and, and this is what we kind of did was would be bake into it ways that people can connect and be creative because that's what people ultimately, ultimately are motivated by for the most part. I think that that, that we can definitely do that with our clans. I think there's definitely an opportunity for it. And as we keep mentioning it, let's look at that then. Let's talk about this product. We've seen the, uh, the f- playtest rules and a playtest like adventure pack that you've sent us and eventually you're going to send us like the completed products and then we're, 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 uh, we're going to look at it yeah um, if you guys we... want to um if you guys want to do a competition with your listeners then we can give that away as a, a couple of a couple of prizes as well if, if that's something you, you feel like doing we'd love that if you wouldn't mind but um... I've, to- I've totally guilted you into that now because like yeah. listen to this we'll, we'll come back to you going like what did you say? Where's, you where's, say? The art, where's the art clans? Yeah. So, um, what, okay then. So, well, me and Leon are going to review that because sometimes we have very different views on things. So, how that will work is it will be basically be like two videos pasted together and okay. see if we agree on yeah. stuff. But for those who don't know, and if you were like, again, uh, you're probably sick of having to sell it, but give us the elevator, the elevator, the elevator pitch for. Okay art clans for those of us who, uh, for those of us or those people who don't know because we keep referring to it and we've read it but other people haven't so art, art clans is a world for fifth edition D, and it instead of having a uh, standard uh, mage classes in it and standard spell lists uh, it has an open system of magic creation which means that um, we have uh, things called spell forges that all classes are able to visit and use some are able to use them and create magical items others can use them and make spells um and the caster classes which are really the caster classes are add-ons to uh, four base classes that we've got so um the caster classes can have different magical abilities outside the spell forges and then the ability to make spells inside them and the thing about the spells, the spell forging, is that every spell is unique to that character. Um, they are uh, bespoke to the character, and the character can design them in almost any way that they, they see fit, based on the number of fate points that they have. So that um, they, you, you know, it it, it limits the uh, the ability to create an an awesome super destroy everything spell. 
but it also gives the uh, it puts creativity back onto onto the player um and so that combined with uh, four original new character origins we've dropped the word race for uh, very very good reasons because it was ultimately a fascist idea and not really what you want in a, a family product um and we've got um four original uh, base classes as i said and three magical add-on classes so it gives you a combination of 16 different character choice character class choices um and it's set in a world where magic has just returned so magic has been out of the picture for about three thousand years and now it's it has been a cataclysmic event god has essentially died and the magic that was stored inside God, the Keeper, has poured back into the world and suddenly charged up these things called spell forges. And, that, and now, if you're a player in this world, a, a character in this world, uh, you're distinguished from normal uh, individuals because you have this thing inside you called fate, which makes you sort of essentially a, a hero. Um, there are uh, a number of uh, our character origins that you, you mentioned. Coral, coral are psychic mutants that were created by this wave of magic pouring into the world. We'll come back to them because I yeah. want to talk about them so much. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. There are the the, the half fae who are, are part human, part kind of uh, spirit, nature spirit. The the fae are these mysterious characters locked in a, a, a deep dark wood, uh, and their half human offsprings have been uh, kind of emerge uh, on, on, on the edge of that. There are the half ferg. Uh, the ferg are a giant, sort of eight, ten foot tall uh, craftsmen. They're like, uh, if you imagine all the standard dwarfy sort of tropes, but in a giant body. Uh, and the and, and half ferg are sort of seven and a half feet tall. So they're your tank character. Um, there are human beings, and there there are, are amphibian uh, hunters called the Jiraki. Um And so that's that's the the other way to pitch um without kind it's of a very good pitch it's a very good pitch oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> keep, it, keep it short you see keep it short uh, <laughs> quite a few unique selling points there you know you've got the spell forge you've got all the different races you've got the the, the changes to the class system so many because we, we, we've spoken about unique selling points before on the podcast and yours is just completely full of them. You could take you could take one of these things. You could take the the spell forge on its own, and that's your new, unique selling point. But you just pack this thing with you've you've changed so much stuff um, compared to vanilla D and D that it, it, it kind of feels like a completely different system. Oh, it's oops. hold on. Let me rephrase that. It feels like a completely different yet very familiar system. Ah, oh, great. Great. Which I think is what you're going for, and that's oh. what I've got from this. I feel like yeah. I can just pick this up and start playing it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very well versed in 5e, but yeah. um, I think most people that are well versed in 5, 5e could just literally pick this up and yeah. read it within a couple of hours. They could run at least a one shot. Oh, I, I do hope so. Um, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> great if that works. I'm there's there's some mechanics to get your head around, but um, it, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm. I'm, I'm yeah. Very, uh, I'm very much enjoying what I've been reading so far. You got to. Work, I think if you're doing it, and what I try to do is walk a tightrope between eject, getting rid of a few old tropes. You know, um, kind being of being able to fireball everything. Yeah, <laughs> and, and sort of, you know, a grum, a grumpy dwarf and a wise elf. You know, sort of, but you can't. Also, if you're going to get rid of tropes and kind of try to reimagine things you can't do different for different sake either um no, because be then good. yeah it, it's going to be so, well why why is there this why is there that why is um why why is the world uh, as it is and i i think um if, if you look if you go go into sort of trope world if you look at um you know uh, things like um uh, tolkien and, and stuff like that um the the reason that the world is as it is in um, Lord of the Rings is because it, it starts out with a kind of central organising premise of like you know the the uh, which is um, the the idea of Morgoth and all of, you know the, um, um, the the fall of Manus in in essence you know and all this kind of 
basically kind of Christian allegory. And I know there's lots of people that kind of argue that Tolkien isn't to Christian allegory, but it, it, it's all really, it's really in it, you know. Didn't he have a bet with C.S. Lewis that they both yeah, of them it, rewrite parts of the Bible and he wrote Lord of the Rings and he wrote The Chronicles of Narnia? So I, I yeah, think, yeah, don't go to the point. If you don't want to come up with a Christian allegory. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, um, so, so there's a kind of a central organising concept. And, and I, I suppose that the central organising concept in Arklands way, is that if, if there was a monotheistic god that everybody worshipped and thought was brilliant, on, on closer inspection he wasn't actually quite as perfect and on the money as he thought he was, and now he's sort of exploded. Um, where, <laughs> so, you know, um, uh, that that's the central organising concept really, and everything else kind of ripples out from there. Um, so start with a kind of a, a big and fairly sort of easy to understand idea and then all the little kind of bits and bobs all sort themselves out um i want to ask you it's not actually on our list of questions but i think now so now that you've we talked about the unique selling points and stuff like that um i get a very like polynesian feeling from like oh, yeah. um, from uh arklands almost like um how I imagine like the ancient Maori to live, like going through like the the, the islands and stuff like that, and, yeah. and the the river systems and all all yeah. that. Is, was that intentional? The the bit of the world where you're where the the one shot adventure you, Aloris, um has aspects of you. I suppose you could see it as aspects of Polynesia. Mm. I originally imagined that part of the world to be. Perhaps um, what Burma and Bangladesh are like. So it'd be, again, with big deltas um, and, 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 and rainforests and, and, and that kind of odd thing. Um, most of the world is because it, it isn't like that at all. So there are um, uh, bits of the world which might resemble um, kind of, I suppose, sort of medieval England, stroke Germany bits of the world which look kind of like Byzantium um, and bits of the world which are kind of as, as you would imagine probably what the the, 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 the Mediterranean was like in, in about the 12th or the 13th century sorry I'm going to full, full on history teacher now I was um, going to say you've, you, you've definitely used your degree to full effect here I like it I like yeah, it a lot. yeah. <laughs> it's no, nothing in the world has quite reached the Renaissance yet but um, the the reason why it's called Artlands is that the 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 kind of the, the centre of the world there's a, a large ocean in the middle of the of, of the central continent, and there's an arc of uh, there's a city there called Arc, uh, and then there's, there's a kind of essentially a crescent of very fertile, very wealthy land uh, in which the nine city states um, are, uh, and they. Um, are really like the center of world civilization and everything else the periphery it's like chaotic nations so um I, I mean obviously you you know I, being informed by world history and, and looking at different civilizations and, and, and that kind of thing is, is always is very 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 helpful um and I think you you know you could the, the, uh, for example in Game of Thrones, obviously George Martin makes some very kind of clear nods towards what, say, certain parts of Westeros clearly, clearly are. Mm, yeah, um, I think it's it's not necess necessary. You, you don't necessarily have to do that to make a good fantasy world. I I like a bit more, uh, uh, and even sort of put in there that you know this language is a bit like Latin. This language is a bit like Turkic, kind of Uzbek. Um, this language is a bit sort of like Japanese and I, I know there's been a lot of controversy recently uh, about a, a long forgotten D&D um, &D supplement Oriental Adventures uh, and if you've ever read, read your Edward Said Oriental is a very kind of contentious and complex and problematic word um, and I know I, I, I've always found it interesting that Wizards of the Coast had never resurrected that book because it was very, very popular at the time, back back in the day, and it was, you know, um, it was Dungeons and Dragons with samurais and ninjas and that kind of stuff. Do you think but, that might have been because of um, the the what was it? 
is it Tomb of Annihilation backlash that they had? Oh, what was that? Because when they revived Tomb of Annihilation, there was a lot of um, backlash towards that with like racial in- uh, insensitivity, and, like almost like the because it was almost like Central America yeah. and like uh, uh, Incas and uh, mm. those sort of indigenous peoples, and then the conquistadors came. So, yeah. the, the, do you think that the reason why they haven't done that is because my 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 guess is is this is that the if, if the the original um, Oriental adventures for me again, firstly, Oriental is a very problematic term because um, it's sort of like you know it, it's the, the the way that Victorian explorers describe those funny people over there. It really uh, and it's a very colonial term. Uh, and also, if you had, I think, um, a, um, if, if you had, basically. European or American uh, games designers in the 1980s creating a fantasy world uh, which was an amalgam of Asian cultures because Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Malay, Thai cultures are not all the same thing. They are massively distinctive. And then lumping them all together and going, wow, it's all, you know, you, they might as well have said they all look the same, don't they? You know, the, the, this is true, yeah. That's the kind of the level of clumsiness. There are some amazingly well done uh, role play games about medieval Japan. Um, I, I think uh, and the, the video game Ghosts of, of Tsushima recently. Um, I mean, it look, looks fantastic and, and generally authentically well done. And I think you could you could definitely do that. Um, the the, the tightrope is. I mean, we've um, used elements of, say, for example. Um, elements of, of of medieval japan dotted in certain places like there is um a, a, a culture uh, called the via folk who um was that, who, who have uh kind of certain aspects of, of sort of samurai martial culture about them but by kind of creating some an, an, an entirely new culture which might have aspects of of, of uh, medieval Japan, but not sort of kind of lumping in roughly anything that you think might perhaps be something from Southeast Asia into one melting pot. Um, then hopefully that can be kind of skillfully navigated. Um, I think if you're a very very big games design company these days, um, it, it really behoves you to have very very kind of clear cultural sensitivities and and you know when in doubt perhaps have people who are experts in that culture to to advise you i i don't think i don't i don't i don't think the world of kind of um uh kind of cultural politics was any anywhere near the near as, as advanced as it was sort of 30 odd years ago yeah so, I, yeah we've because also as well you're taking when you look at art clans um you're taking uh, well, in the playtest bit, not so much, but I'm guessing in the whole thing, you're taking bits from everywhere. Yeah. Whereas having having one, like one, like you said, like a, a melting pot of all these cultures, just this one specific set of cultures from yeah. around the same area, it does get into that that almost like uh, uh, what's it? Uh, it ages badly. Yeah, it's, it does. It does. And you might say, well, if you look at you know. D and D is that not an amalgam of kind of um, me- you know medieval European tropes? And so I suppose it is really, mm-hmm. um, but it 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 doesn't have a kind of this is goes to so it doesn't have a kind of um, a baggage you know the the real world baggage of colonialism attached to it because mm-hmm. um, Europeans did go to Asia in the nineteenth century and dream of what they thought Asia was all about. So, mm-hmm. um, so me and Leon have got some things that we specifically want to talk about in yeah. in, in the book. So I'm, I'm going to go first and talk about my favourite thing that I've seen so far, which is the corale, corale, oh, yes, the corral, the corral, yeah. the corral. Oh, um, I love them mainly because I think. They remind me of the X Men. I'm a massive comic book nerd. Like mm. Le- Leon seen me in Forbidden Planet. It's not. It's not okay. I, I look like I- I've got some sort of problem. 
but um they remind me of the x-men like the idea of like sonics and um yeah like and some and a lot of them have like natural defects as well don't they it's like the race that uh has telekinesis but they have no arms yeah and stuff like that um can, can we ask about that because D yeah, sure. themselves have kind of given up on Psionics. So, what what was the basis for the Corale? What why did you include them? Sort of well, thing? I, th- I think Addison need... get it right. Corale. The Corale. I, I think it was about giving a, a different a different tone within the mechanics. The spell forging is you know the the central cog of of all of our clans. Um, but I wanted. To, I, I sometimes believe that if you have uh, everybody working on the on, on, on the same central, then it becomes quite turgid. If you can inject into it a little, they're they're almost like a little bit of chaos. Um, yeah. They they're not they they can't be normal casters, but they can do all sorts of other cool stuff. Um, and it, it, it gives people the option of imagining the game in a, a different way, um, or uh, playing it in a, a in a different way. Uh, I was going to ask whether that was that was a that was a mechanic you intended that they like kind of went against the grain. Yeah. And with that answer, you've 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 answered that. So yeah, yeah it is. It's, it's about trying to undermine your own your own work basically, um, and also. I liked the idea. I liked the idea of misfits and outsiders, and people. One of the one of the difficulties when you get a very well established fantasy world is that every group from the dwarves to the drow are are, are known and understood in that world, and because you and and this is the the, the nature of of kind of um, uh, of, of games. Because you don't want to have a um, a world where somebody's character who might be a half orc is um, not kind of welcome in the in the tavern. You start to drift towards a world where uh, nothing is other, nothing is different, nothing is misunderstood, nothing is mysterious or feared, um, and and the corral virtually nobody knows about. They are like the X Men in that regard, in that they're a total mystery, and the world is waking up to the fact that there are Corral, and they know a little bit more about the Half Fae, um, and Half Ferg are pretty common. Um, but there is that, but kind of baked into the narrative of the world is that your your character, if you choose one of these, will be a mysterious outsider, and will have to be careful um, who they trust. Uh, and might be um, kind of uh, misunderstood. Uh, so that's much as you know the characters in the X Men are. Yeah, I, I just I just like everything about them. I like uh, the different types. So you've got like your, your standard mind reader. Mm-hmm. You've got your 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 telekinetic. You've got uh, the the golden eyed ones who who actually they don't look uh, they have tendrils that extend from their yes. like hair from their scalp uh, you've got so they look a bit uh, then you've got obviously the armless characters mm-hmm. it's just so much that you can do with this race and i quite like that like secret society yeah that they have and like is it let me just find it because i also like the voices of the choir yeah that they can just talk psychically and you know that they do that with each other all the time yeah. So once you start adding them into the world, and once you're if if your party play none of them and your party discover one almost, um, and then they start talking and they're like, "Hang on, yeah, like there's more of them. There must be because they're talking to me like this. Do they always talk to each other like this? It it just adds like this massive underlayer. Mm-hmm. And I do like your uh, the what you said about the fact that sometimes with vanilla D and D we don't we don't dare step towards like the the thing of like outsiders yeah um because for some reason they live in some sort of like utopia where everybody gets along even though yeah. even in even in the source material it says these people do not like these people yeah 
but because, like, you know when when they, they they sort of relaunch tom and jerry and tom and jerry are friends it's like no, no that's that's all right that's all right <laughs> yeah you've taken, you've taken the dramatic tension out of the entire cartoon <laughs> is that true did they really yeah, they did they did it was horrible it was obscene <laughs> you know i was there waiting for like no like pranks to as well hit jerry with a coal scuttle and you know for there to be like a little outline of, and that kind of and then they, they they did in the 1990s a Tom and Jerry cartoon with Tom and Jerry a friend, and it's like, it was, uh, you know, it was it was it was creepy. It was actually creepy. <laughs> uh, so Leon, what did you want to talk about? What was what's your favourite thing from Art Clans? Well, let me preface this by saying, as, as much as I enjoy Five E, Five E is a fantastic system. The, the the biggest issue I have with it is the complete lack of customization. Um, you know, a, a level 20 paladin is a level 20 paladin. The the mm. only glaring difference is going to be the subclass, which you choose at level 3. Um, you may choose some feats along the way, but other than that, a level 20 paladin is a level 20 paladin. And, you know, once you've been... that That's as a player. Once you've been DMing for um, as long as I have, um, probably not as long as uh, you have, Nick, um, it gets to a point where you know everything about all the classes, you know everything about all the races, you know everything about all the spells. Um, so nothing really surprises you. So the thing I am hoping that you could talk a little bit about here, Nick, is the spell forge and how you completely turned that 5e formula on its head. Not f turned it on its head, but how you completely pulled it apart and um, used that to create your spell forge, which I think is the most exciting thing. One of the most exciting things I I've seen for 5e in a very, very long time. That's very kind of you. Well, I, I was like, I mean, I thought, you know, building a new game world. I was thinking, but long before the spell forges were kind of conceived of, I, I had this thought of, well, what is the point of making this world if all you're going to do is create a spell list or spell lists that, you know, are a bit different from D and D. You, you know, you have fire something that you know fire hammer or something like that instead of fireball um but the moment that you know what will happen is somebody will play this game they will get up to level 20 they'll play it for hope you know if you're lucky a, a year or two um and and then they will have explored everything there is to to explore i thought wow what's the point of creating a new game world and then creating a sort of like boundaries that you you, you can't get through you're, you're giving so people so they can sell us the next book well <laughs> oh yeah there's that isn't there but I thought yeah. well what, what do people do you know what do what do people do with computers these days I mean computers if you were coming to our world and you had never been here before you come from a different dimension so well, what is your magic and you say ah it is this this thing called computer code and you've got a generation of people that have grown up with coding um, and they, they understand it in ways that I basically don't. And I thought, well, what if magic was like code? What if you could snip it up and rearrange it and put it back together? And I thought, wow, well, that's, that's kind of very much the modern idiom, isn't it? Um, um, and uh, so it's just my wife wondering if I'm done talking. Um, and I thought, well, that's that's the trick then, isn't it so always what you're doing um is trying to give creativity back to the player now the the mechanics of of, of the spell forging um that was what uh, micah um our games designer designed and basically you know he, he's uh, i said to him when we met look i've got this idea and it sort of works but only in my head um, what do you think? Uh, and he went away and took a year and created it. Um, and through us having long, long conversations about, it, so what is what is it that that we do here, and what how does it work, and how does it function? But the the philosophy was always about empowering the creativity of the player, because the the players they are the engine of the creativity in the game. The GM can say well you can do that and you can't do that and here's the here's how the story is kind of flowing and uh, this is what the dice are telling us the creators are always really the the, the players 
Um, and I thought uh, D&D 5e has, you know, some, it's more, it's, you know, it's, you, you, there's more individualiz- individualization and individuation than there was. Um, but what if you gave them the ultimate tool of creativity? Uh, and that's the magic. Um, and I thought, well, and uh, that's kind of in, in line a little bit with um, what I believe about many things about, you know, democratizing them, kind of give give things to the people and, and trust that things will work out. You know, it doesn't always work out like that, does it? Um, uh, and, and hopefully um, there'll be some really exciting stuff. And what I hope for, uh, and this has begun to happen, but hopefully we will we'll have a lot more of it, is we'll have loads of people come back to us and say, hey, I did this cool thing. And uh, people can swap what they created and, and share and, and swap ideas. And the we, we did some playtesting and people came up with kind of ideas I'd, I'd never considered before. There's this brilliant one where um, uh, someone created a, this, this armor shred where what happens is you you cast a spell in an area and it um, shreds the armor of your enemies uh, for a period of time you know when the spell wears off the arm starts to kind of reform itself but for you know a a certain number of rounds you've got a a huge advantage when it comes to to combat yeah uh, those stories are, are like great aren't they they're they're good and they help us to like know that we're working well as DMs and as, and in your case as game designers. So, no, that's that's, that's, that's I'm not gonna lie, it's just fucking cool. Like I can't, I can't hold it in. It's just fucking cool. Um, so, obviously the the Kickstarter's coming to an end soon. What date is is that going to be? Well, the 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 actual Kickstarter's finished. That was that finished in January, so we've fully funded. But our product is launching on September the second. Uh, if you follow Verse uh, Studios on Twitter, mm-hmm. as of Thursday, we're doing our fourteen day countdown. Uh, so there's going to be some some cool stuff, some new cool art going up there. Maybe a, a couple of giveaways for um, people who who follow us. Um, and then, yeah, we'll be uh, launched on on the second, which is going to be just amazing, hopefully. And where else will they be able to get it from? Uh, like, obviously, because that's all once it's all delivered and everything to the you'll, to the be, back of... you'll be able to buy it from Drive Through RPG in PDF and physical copy, so print on demand. Um, we're, we are starting to um, get into a, a few. Um, small role play game bookshops here in Wales, um, and hopefully we'll be making um, uh, we'll be, be sort of branching out. This is like part two of the operation is to um, get in touch with uh, retailers up and down the land. Uh, hopefully without some big greedy distributor sucking up all the money. Um, but drive through RPG for now is. is easiest way to to access it and that will be ready on the 2nd of september also just a, a quick question before we we start like wrapping up asking you and asking you to take part in our segment the deck of many questions um who did all the art because the art is by the way phenomenal like it's so good <laughs> the we have a, a a phenomenal artist called katia katia Moskvina um and you know watch that name because this girl's going places she really is um uh, if uh you know if, if there's anybody out there that is looking for a, a, an incredible artist then she's your gal um and she did the, the layout the design the maps absolutely everything she's um a, a prodigious talent genuinely jealous of her talent so nick again thank you so much for coming to talk to us today you've very um, well. us about art clans and kickstarter and everything else um is there anything else you'd like to shout out or say this is our part of the of the show where we uh, I give just, it over yeah, to you just, say just a, a, a colossal thanks a colossal thanks to firstly all of our backers because this project just would not have happened without them and every trusted and had faith in us um to janet and demetrius at world anvil who they have their third birthday today if you 
uh, aren't familiar with World Anvil, go and check it out. It's the most brilliant world building tool you can uh, imagine, and they've been incredible kind of allies to to our plans uh, throughout all, all of this. And also to, to, to all the people in the D&D community that have just come alongside us with so much goodwill um, and who, when, when we've had successes, they've been, been happy for us, which, you know, in a lot, it's pretty rare in life, really, isn't it? You know, most people are kind of quite bitter and twisted inside. <laughs> but in, uh, in, in the D&D crazy world, in the D&D community, especially yeah. on Twitter. You know, yeah. you, you say the wrong thing or, or you say the right thing and, and somebody's going to jump down your throat. So it is good when you can find those the, the, those yeah. gems in the community. Lovely people. Lovely people. Yeah, and we, and we are really, really glad for for your collaboration, reaching out to us, letting us yeah. uh, review the full product when it's, when it's available. And we will give out those codes as part of that review, I think, awesome. is the best way to do it. Uh, we'll send those through. Um, so, so we're going to go through now onto our uh, segment called the Deck of Many Questions. And what it is is it's basically we have a bunch of questions we've been given from friends, people who listen on YouTube and stuff like that. And Nick, we'd like to ask you the question and then close up if that's okay. Would you like to okay. answer some of our questions? Um, happy to. Happy to. Uh, so there are forty-two questions. We'll ask you a question. Shao asked uh, asked it, and then. You, let you go uh, back to your wife and and, and your life. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Leon, have you got the dice ready? I do. I have rolled question 40. Question 40. Which I think has come up quite a few times. <laughs> uh, if you want to ch- uh, change it. Uh, no, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the question is off the top so of my head. Plus, Nick won't have, answer, won't have answered yeah. it anyway. So, this question is from our friend Alex Boston, uh, who we're having on the podcast soon. And. Uh, it says, what was your least favourite character that you've ever DM'd for? Like, your least favourite character. It doesn't have to be like a horror story or anything, but it could just be like, oh, they just annoyed me because. Least favourite character? That's a good one. That's a good one. That's um, a carefully worded question as well. Yeah. Let, let me think. That I've ever DM'd, DM'd for. Um... I think there was there was one that was genuinely very uh, very upsetting and distressing. Um, there was uh, I was one of our our writers, Alex, um, has he's he's kind of uh, a, a great kind of thespian really and undiscovered, and he would ha- he had a rogue character. Um, he got so much into character and so much kind of obsessed with his kind of violent criminal kind of upbringing that he, he would he would really kind of um, do, all, do all sorts of... He'd mistreat prisoners, you know, I don't want to go into it too much. But um, but he adopted also this, this strange, slightly Dick Van Dyke, Mary Poppins uh, kind of Cockney, Cockney accent. That should um, have been so off-put in, like, and doing all these horrible things. Well... Sometimes when people go in, go fully into character in a role play game, it's hard to see where the person begins and the character ends. And it was un- it was unsettling. I was like, Alex, this is this is this is you know, I because I don't normally go into character. I'll just sort of say, well, my my ranger is going to do this. Uh, but he 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 was there going, you know, I'm going to cut his ear off. And, it, and you know, it's like, well, okay, this is this is problematic. But um, you know. It, it was one. It was quite a sort of a third, fourth wall surreal sort of experience. So I think that was that was my my, my settling my uh, as a as a DM. Um, yeah, and uh, that 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 would be that, and that that sort of kind of bleak and weird note to uh, <laughs> to end. We, we, trust me, we've ended on a lot weirder notes. <laughs> so thank you very much, Nick, for coming. Thank you very, very much for partnering with us. We're really yeah. excited to see Arklands to play it. And right. we will make sure that it's linked all linked up when you send us the stuff through in the description oh. of this video and all stuff. So oh. thank you very much. And uh, if you want to be in the deck of many questions, send us your questions on Twitter, Instagram, <laughs> YouTube, anything. Like, just send it and we'll put your name next to it and we will shout you out when we ask yeah. it. So... All right. Hey. What take was that? Care. Take care, friends. Take fo- take care, folks. And wherever you are, whenever you are, I hope that you chilled out with us, that you had a good time, 
and I hope you check out Artlands. See you in a bit. All the best. Bye. Spellforge. Oh, yes.